Hello, and welcome to Debugging Complex Issues in Web Applications. My name is Mark Thomas, and you'll find me posting on the Tomcat mailing list as markt at apache.org. I'm involved in several projects at the ASF, including the Commons projects that feed into Tomcat, also at Eclipse in Jakarta EE projects, and my day job is at VMware, where I get to spend the vast majority of my time working on Apache Tomcat. This is the agenda for today's session. Because the session is being pre-recorded, then if you do have any questions, please ask them in the chat, and I will endeavor to join the session when it's played back and answer those questions in the chat. If I don't get there straight away, I'll get there as soon as I can. And if for any reason I miss anything, please do ping me on the user's mailing list, and I'll be happy to answer any remaining questions there. So let's start with what do I mean by complex issues? Now, this is going to be subjective, but for me, there are three factors that make a issue particularly complex to debug. The first is that it isn't 100% repeatable. Um, the harder it is to repeat, the harder it is to debug. And generally, that's because whatever process you use for your debugging, at some point, there's going to be a step that says something like, repeat until the issue it, you see the issue again. And the harder it is to repeat, the longer that step is going to be. So essentially, the longer the debugging process is going to take. Second factor is issues that only occur under load. Um, partly that, that's issue with, issues with repeatability, but primarily it's issues with the volume of data that's created. Uh, when things happen under load, obviously there's a lot of debug logging, there's a lot of access logs, there's a lot of network logs. And working through that data to find the bit of information that you really need takes longer if there's more of it. And the third factor is concurrency. This indicates that the issue is caused by some sort of interaction between two or more threads. And that means it's very timing dependent. And because of that, as soon as you start doing any sort of debugging activity, you can often interrupt that timing and that makes it harder to repeat. So again, it sort of feeds into the repeatable, but it's a particular reason for it. Now, before we go and look at a couple of use cases, I want a quick mention of statistics. And I think the key message here is you're going to need to collect more data than you think you do. So if you think of testing in terms of you do something and it either happens or it doesn't. So it might be you send a request, it fails or it doesn't. You run a load test for 20 minutes, you see the error or you don't. That kind of pass fail type test. What you typically want to do is repeat that test a number of times make a change and then repeat that test again. And what you're looking for is, is there a statistical difference between the tests before and the tests afterwards? Or in other words, did the change you make actually make a difference? And to get a reasonable degree of statistical certainty around that, um, you, it's a good idea to follow the, the following sort of rough rule of thumb. Now, I'm an engineer, not a mathematician, so this is only a rule of thumb. But broadly, you need to have at least 20 tests you need to have at least five of them pass and at least five of them fail. If you don't meet any one of those tests, you need to meet, you need to do more tests until you repeat, until you achieve all three of them. So you do need to test lots. And obviously there's an edge case there. If you've actually fished the issue, fixed the issue, then it's never going to repeat. And you'll obviously see that in the data. So you kind of have to sort of make a judgment call on that. What I find is quite useful is keeping notes. Um, so I'll do the tests, record the results, make a change, make a note what it is, do the tests again, record those. And I'll do that several times. And it's often the case that I'll look back at those results and think, well, hang on a minute, is that really as significant as I thought it was? Or might I just be seeing some statistical variation there? And having the notes is very useful because then I can go back, see exactly what I changed, do additional testing if I want to, and get a greater degree of assurance whether there is or isn't actually um, some statistical significance to whatever change that I observed. One thing just to keep in mind with all of this is that issues can have multiple root causes. It doesn't always happen. In fact, it very rarely happens, but it's a possibility. So keep it in mind when you're looking at the results of your testing. And with that, let's go and look at our first use case. So this comes from the user's mailing list back in June this year. Uh, there are the references if you want to go and look it up and follow along. Now, this was a very well-written bug report. And what it told us was that when there were multiple HTTP2 streams on the same connection, what the user was observing, that all those streams were blocked indefinitely. 
Uh, they went on to say that they were blocked indefinitely because they were using an infinite timeout. If they set the timeout to 30 seconds and they were all blocked for 30 seconds and then they, they ended. So essentially they're blocking until they time out. And they described the scenario in sufficient detail that we could actually create a test case. We didn't need to because they'd very kindly provided us with one anyway. But had we needed to create a test case, then they gave us that information. And in this case, it was actually quite simple. Um, to recreate the issue, what you needed to do was write large files, and by large, I mean multiple gigabytes, and you needed to have three or more concurrent HTTP2 streams on the same connection trying to write those files. Do that, and uh, you'd see the error that they reported. Now, they also told us that they tried the same test with HTTP 1.1 and couldn't recreate it. They could only recreate it with HTTP 2. Now that's indicative that the problem's in HTTP 2, but it might just be that the particular code path that follows happened to hit a timing issue that triggered the, triggered the problem. So it might not be an HTTP 2, but I'd say it's reasonably likely. And um, they also tried, told us they tried to you test with and without the servlet non-blocking API. That's really useful to know because um, writing a test case that uses a non-blocking API and debugging it is much more complicated than writing a test case and debugging one that uses the blocking API. And the fact that the issue still occurs with the blocking API means we can use the simpler test case. They'd also tested with Tomcat's IOU tools to do the file copying, and that didn't make any difference. They still saw the error. So that indicates that whatever file copying code they'd written in their app was written correctly and wasn't the cause of the problem. They gave us all the relevant version numbers, and as I said, they provided us with a test case. They've even gone a little bit further and done some simple analysis, and what they'd observed was all of these streams were waiting for the same semaphore. The only piece of information that was really missing was that they didn't mention how easy the issue was to repeat. Um, we asked that question, got the answer within about 60 minutes, and it happens about 60% of the time. Now, we need to sort of have an understanding of what's going on here to help us work out how we go to narrow down what's going on. So we need to know that HTTP2 connections are multiplexed. You've got multiple streams where each stream represents a request and a response, and it's possible that all of those responses are going to want to write at the same time. To ensure that the streams don't get mixed up, the responses don't get mixed up, there's a semaphore that ensures that only one writes at a time. The other piece of information that's quite important here is internally, HTTP2 is using an asynchronous write and a completion handler. So what happens if the write can't complete immediately, then the socket is added to the polar. The polar then waits for an indication that the write can continue. And then the write continues. If it can't complete, it goes back in the polar. If it can complete, it calls the completion handler. So there's quite a bit of state associated with that write. And all of that state is held in an operation state object. And that object is written to the write operation field in the socket wrapper so that the state is available throughout the duration of the write. So with all of this information, the first thing we did was recreated the issue. We were able to do that within 90 minutes of the original report landing on the user's mailing list. That's really quick. And it's a good indicator of just how good the um, original report was. But because we can recreate it, it means we can include an exclude functionality quite quickly. That helps us narrow down where we need to look. One of the things that Remy suggested was try disabling the asynchronous IO. When we did that, we found that, oh, problem goes away. There's a helpful workaround for the user, and it also helps us focus on where the error is likely to be. Um, the user did just query, oh, what about the performance impacts of disabling it? And the short answer is it really doesn't matter because you're writing multiple large files over a single um, HTTP connection. Your performance is going to be atrocious anyway. So the impact of turning asynchronous IO on or off it really isn't going to make any difference. Uh, the other thing we tested was whether or not the issue repeated with NIO2, and it didn't. So that was another opportunity for a workaround there, just switching from NIO to NIO2. So now we want to try and identify the root cause. Um, we could see that the threads are waiting for the semaphore, and we know that the semaphore should have been released by the polar indicating it was ready to write. That obviously hasn't happened. So the first thing we do is we start with a code review and we're looking at the handling of the semaphore, the polar, all around the asynchronous IO write. And the first thing I spot is that the interest ops flag that's used by the socket wrapper to keep a record of which operations the socket is currently registered with for the polar, that was non-volatile, but it was being accessed by multiple threads. Now that may or may not be a problem. It depends on the exact order that those um, accesses happened and what else was going on. 
but it looked like a, a possible candidate. So I tried a quick test, made it volatile, rerun in the test case. And initially it looked really good. Oh, it's not happening. But remembering my statistics guide, I did some more tests, had a larger sample size, and that showed me that actually it made not the slightest bit of difference. So we put that back to non-volatile and thought, okay, need to really look at what's going on between the socket and the polar. Is that working the way that it's meant to? Now, when I do debugging, generally what I want to do is I want to record the current state of things. I want to let something happen. Um, obviously that something tends to be at quite a high level to start with, and then it narrows down and focuses um, as we figure out what's going on and where the problem's likely to be. But record the state beforehand, let something happen, record the state afterwards. And what I'm really looking for is is the state change I observed between before and after consistent with what should have happened given whatever the thing was that was happening in the middle? Um, the problem with doing that is, is logging the before state. As soon as you log the before state, because generating debug log messages is relatively expensive, that affects the timing and that can often impact on re repeatability. And that's exactly what happened here. So what I needed to do was change my logic logging strategy and use a technique that I've used elsewhere. And the way that works is rather than generating debug log messages for the before state, I create local variables and copy the before state across into those variables. And that copying is a lot, lot faster than generating the debug log messages. And it usually doesn't impact on whatever thing it is I'm trying to examine with the before and after logging. So I let that thing happen. Then afterwards, I log that state from those local variables after the things happened. And obviously I can log the after state as well. And doing it that way, it's much less likely to affect the timing. And that was the case in this particular um, debugging session. And after a lot of debugging, which was spent most of a day on this, uh, my conclusion was actually the polar is working perfectly correctly. Now that's good in a way that, in one way, yeah, the polar is working, that's great. It's not so good in that we haven't found the root cause. So we carry on. We can see that the polar signaling that right was possible. So really the semaphore should have been released. Why didn't that happen? So the next thing I started to do was to trace the right notification. And as soon as I did that, it was blinding the obvious what was going wrong. The operation state instance, where all the states should have been about this ongoing right, was null. That meant the uh, polar event wasn't processed, so the asynchronous right never completed and eventually timed out. Why was it null? I did a quick code review, found a potential root cause, fixed it, um, applied that fix, Local testing confirmed that it was fixed. I was able to explain my fix on the mailing list, meant other committers could check my reasoning. I was also able to see, well, have we made a similar mistake elsewhere? Because the read code and the write code are practically identical, I could see that we'd made exactly the same error in the read code as we had the write code. So I was able to fix both, even though nobody had even reported an issue with the read code. For those of you that want to understand exactly what was going on, you'll need the code in front of you. Um, the link to GitHub is there and it's socket wrapper base. And if we think of it in terms of having just two threads, thread one and thread two, or T1 and T2 in, on the slides, and they're both trying to write to the output at the same time. So they're both trying to get the semaphore. And as it happens, thread one gets the semaphore first. So it creates its operation state to keep a record of the state for this asynchronous write that's in progress, and it saves it. That asynchronous write then completes, thread one completes, and the completion handler is gold at which point the completion handler says, right, don't need the semaphore anymore because I finished the write. And thread two says, aha, I was waiting for that. Thank you very much. I'll take the semaphore. Thread two then creates its operation state and writes it. Meanwhile, thread one's completion handler continues and says, ah, right, I finished my write so I can clear the operation state. But the operation state it clears is the state belonging to thread two because thread two overwrote thread one. And that's essentially the bug happening there. Those things are happening in the wrong order. But at this, this point, thread two doesn't see the problem. The asynchronous write continues, but for whatever reason, it doesn't complete. So the socket's added to the polar. A little bit later, when the socket um, is available for write again, polar signals that, goes to look for the operation state in the write operation field, finds it's null, and that's where things go wrong. And the async write eventually times out, as I say, because it never receives the notification. The fix was quite simple. It's just a case of swapping the, the um, instructions in the semaphore. So in, in the um, completion handler. So now what happens is thread one first clears its operation state, then it releases the semaphore. That will release the next thread, 
which will be able to obtain the semaphore and store its operation state in the right operation field. But that then won't be overwritten because we've switched the order of uh, releasing the semaphore and clearing the state. So that was the first use case. Um, second use case again came from the user's mailing list, this back in October last year. It's worth noting on this one that at no point was I able to recreate the error. At no point did I have access to the system where the error was occurring. All of this was done entirely remotely, um, bouncing suggestions and, date and results back and forth over the mailing list, with the exception of some of the more detailed logging because of commercial sensitivities, they got sent to me directly. But all of the important stuff um, is there on the mailing list. And again, it was a well-written bug report. Not as much information as last time though. And what it told us was that very occasionally Tomcat didn't send a response. The access log showed a response, but there was, um, there was no response and there was no errors or exceptions in the normal Tomcat logs. They looked at Wireshark traces and that showed a normal HTTP GET request followed by a normal clean TCP close from Tomcat. And they provided all of the version information and they're using a fairly recent version. Um, we asked various questions to try and eliminate features, possible failure modes. We're really trying to sort of narrow down where do we need to look next. So the first question was how big is the response? The answer is actually quite small. Now that's interesting because the response was only 1K. It means that there are lots of places within Tomcat, within the JVM, within the network stack where the entire response could have been buffered. And it's then possible that a connection times out somewhere and the response sort of just disappears in a buffer. However, our next question was, what's the typical response time? And the answer of 60 milliseconds meant that, yeah, that's not going to be timeout related. So all of the wonderful theories I was coming up with about buffers and timeouts basically got thrown out the window that that wasn't going to be the root cause. A closer look at the Wireshark traces showed that the close started about 100 microseconds after the request was received. So that further ruled out the timeout stuff. But it did open up some other questions. Well, if it's being closed that quickly, is it something that's being that's in the request that's triggering the closure? So we had a closer look at the request. Is it fully sent? And actually, yes, it was. Is it syntactically correct? Yes, it is. Everything about the request was absolutely 100% fine. So it wasn't that. And we'd also asked a question about the architecture, which happened to be user agent to firewall to Nginx to Tomcat. That might have been, it would have been very relevant if uh, we had that timeout issue, but that's not the way things are going. So we filed that away as interesting, but not really relevant. We could also see that the requests were HTTP 1.0 requests. What that meant is we can rule out the HTTP2 HTTP code, which is a reasonable chunk of code. We can also rule out anything related to HTTP 1.1 keep alive. So that helps us focus where things might be going wrong. And although in some ways it makes it more difficult because the HTTP 1.0 request processing path is one of the simplest. So it's really an odd for that to be going wrong. In terms of Wireshark traces, we had traces for both ends of the connection between Nginx and Tomcat. What that meant was we could rule out any strange going ons within the network because what we were seeing exactly the same thing at both ends. Um, so it was great to be able to confirm that, but there was absolutely nothing in those logs that really told us why things were going wrong. And the other piece of information is that the application had a unique ID that mapped, that meant we could use it to correlate information between the logs. At this point on the mailing list, one of the other users um, suggested we use S-Trace. Uh, the original reporter didn't see the suggestion. For me, it felt like a bit too low level. S-Trace is something I use when I suspect the operating system is playing up and I wasn't there yet. This felt more like a possibly an application, possibly Tomcat possibly JVM issue. I and mean, all of those seemed a bit unlikely, but not as unlikely as the operating system. So S-Trace didn't really seem appropriate. Um, so we didn't go that route. In hindsight, it probably would have saved us some time, but we didn't because it didn't seem like the likely way to go. What we did do was try switching from BIO to NIO. That didn't make any difference. Now that's really helpful because it tells us it's not in the BIO or NIO specific code. So that again rules out another chunk of the Tomcat code also tells us it's not likely to be in the JVM because the BIO and NIO code in the JVM are incredibly different, um, almost completely different. So that rules out a JVM issue, which is helpful. I did ask the question how they felt about running custom debug patches. 
They said, well, not ideal, but given where we are, yes, it's something we consider. So we filed that away um, in case we needed to do that. I also asked the question, you know, what's changed recently or what's changed since it started happening? And the answer, of course, oh, no, absolutely nothing's changed. And to be honest, that's normally the answer you get to that question. I think once in about 20 years, as somebody said, oh, yeah, we made the change in server.xml, you go and look at the change, and that's what's triggered the issue. Um, I always ask the question, but I you know, say it's pretty unusual to get a useful answer out of it. We discovered that the system was very lightly loaded, only 20 to 60 requests a second. You know, Tomcat will happily handle orders of magnitude larger than that. So and not a particularly a load related issue. And we had a very careful look at the Wireshark traces, which we got off list. And that essentially prefer, confirmed everything that we'd seen before. So still trying to dig into what was going on. We added some information to the access log and that confirmed that as far as we could tell, Tomcat was writing those bytes. Um, so this is really strange. Tomcat's writing it, but it's never being seen. Um, we know that the issue happens with blocking IO, so it can't be send file that's a factor. We know there's no compression, so it's not gzip. And really at this point, no obvious explanation. So we reached the stage where we really needed to add that custom debug logging to narrow down the search. And the source code we used is in um, a branch on my Tomcat fork on GitHub, and you're welcome to see each of the uh, patches there. So version one of the debug logging was fairly simple. It just confirmed the response was written. It confirmed the socket was closed before the response was written, which is why it's never being seen. And it confirmed that the correct objects were being used. So we weren't doing something silly like writing the response to this output stream associated with a previous response or something. Um, still slightly curious why I wasn't seeing any exceptions at this point though. Uh, debug logging version two, confirmed that the socket was closed way before Tomcat tried to write. It was nothing to do with the write at all, but it also showed us that neither Tomcat nor the application were closing the socket. So things were just a little bit strange at this point. With debug logging version three, I wrapped every method of the socket class and was basically logging entry and exit. And what that showed us, we were getting an exception message on write, uh, an IO exception with the message bad file descriptor. My first thought was, why on earth wasn't that appearing in the debug logs? So we traced that through. And what we found was that the exception was being thrown at a point where you'd often see a IO exception if the user had dropped the connection. And because that was a typical cause, we were basically throwing the exception away, assuming it was uninteresting. That was a mistake. Uh, the Tomcat code has since been changed so that all exceptions at that point are now logged at debug level. And had we had that in place, before we would have got this exception message um, much earlier in the debugging process, and that would have helped move us forward faster. So now we know there's a bad file descriptor. That normally means a socket's been closed, but just check, are oh, we run out of file descriptors? No, we're not, we've got absolutely loads, nowhere near any limits. The next debugging uh, logging looked really closely at the connections between Nginx and Tomcat. And what we were able to show was at the point where at least for one instance where the issue occurred, that was the only connection that was active between Nginx and Tomcat at the time. So that rules out any strange threading issues or anything. So this is really odd. Debug logging version five uh, went had some very, very invasive reflection. It went deep down into the GRE and it was looking to see, well, okay, is the GRE mishandling a file descriptor? That to be honest was a bit of a reach um, there haven't been bugs like that in the GRE since the days of Java 1.2, 1.3, so ages ago. But given the error of message we were getting, we wanted to look at it. And the answer was no, everything looks absolutely fine. So at this point, we thought, right, time to have a look at S-Trace. And the first useful piece of information we got from S-Trace was that the close was actually coming from the J3M, which is really strange. We know the app wasn't calling socket close. We know Tomcat wasn't calling socket.close. How on earth is it closing? And we just couldn't understand it. So we tried to correlate thread dumps with where the close with when the close was occurring. And that didn't really work very well. Um, there was a, for a while we thought there might be something database related, but that was a false alarm. By adding more information to or more options to S Trace and sort of expanding the detail of that and narrowing the focus on the bit we were looking at, really narrowing down just to look at file descriptors, we were eventually able to show, I think it's about three or four iterations with S Trace for this. So what was going wrong was that there was a native library that was mishandling file descriptors after it forked. It was essentially closing the same file descriptor twice. 
So what would happen is the process would quite legitimately open a file descriptor, then it would close it. So far, so good. The file descriptor goes back in the pool. Client makes a connection request to Tomcat. Tomcat opens the socket. The file descriptor gets used for that socket, at which Tomcat reads the request. Then the um, native library closed the descriptor for the second time. That effectively closed the network socket. That broke the connection. So when Tomcat tried to write, you got the bad file descriptor error. So the issue is essentially this native library. And after a little bit of persuasion, I think it took a couple of emails, but we had some pretty conclusive evidence. The vendor accepted that, yes, it was the, the native library that was at fault. There happened to be a library called PDF Tron, and the vendor provided the user with some instructions on how to de disable the use of the library on that particular code path. And we were able to say, well, actually, if you switch Nginx to use HTTP 1.1, you'll get a persistent connection between Nginx and Tomcat. And because the connection is persistent, there's much less likelihood of you picking up a bad file descriptor, and so you should avoid the problem. So we gave the user that advice and they went away very happy. There are a couple of techniques that I use when I'm debugging that I haven't mentioned so far that I just want to run here. Um, first of all, with whether it's logging, whether it's Wireshark, any sort of thing that generates large volumes of output, it's a really good idea to try and use a rolling window. I typically aim for a five minute rolling window. And the idea is that you set the system up that when the error occurs, you copy the current logs. That way you can leave the system running for days if necessary. But when the error occurs, you've got that automatic copy of the logs for the relevant five minutes leading up to the error occurring. That's really helpful. Uh, if I'm debugging Tomcat, I'm often changing the source code, adding additional log messages. When I do that, I normally do it at error level, even that, um, rather than debug level, simply because that means that pops the messages directly into the logs without me having to change the, the log level um, and having any potential timing impacts of that. And it makes it very easy for me to find the extra messages that I'm looking for. Uh, third technique is around network latency. We had an issue where um, users reported they could only re recreate it when they ran Tomcat in the cloud. Fortunately, I had access to a cloud account at the time, so I just did the same thing to recreate it. But you can, do this, you can use um, the latency options in your hypervisor to simulate the same thing, if you like. Any tests that involve load generators, treat the load generator with suspicion. It seems to me that I spend about half my time debugging the Tomcat issue and the other half of my time debugging what the load generator is doing, because it's not behaving in the way that I'd expect it to based on the documentation. Now, ask yourself, is it really multi-threaded? Can it keep up? Um, are the errors you're seeing because it's not handling responses properly or not generating requests properly? Treat the load generator with suspicion. Um, I often, as I say, I've often come across potential issues with load generators in all sorts of tests. If you're doing any sort of debugging around protocols, then Telnet is great. Um, I often find myself opening a Telnet session and manually typing an HTTP request into Tomcat to test something. Really useful tool. For those issues that relate to drop network connections, the only way I find to reliably simulate it is to have two physical machines and just pull a network cable out. Anything else, whether I try Wi-Fi and turning off the Wi-Fi, running in a VM and turning off the network, just killing the browser process, whatever it is, there always seems to be something that seems to spot whatever I've done to drop the connection. Think, oh, there's a drop connection there. I'll clean it up tidily, which is actually the last thing I want. I want the connection to fail. And the only way I find to reliably do that, as I say, is just to pull out the network cable. In terms of multiple platforms, I often see issues that are easier to recreate on one operating system than another. But what I don't see is that bare metal versus a VM makes much difference. I don't think I can, in fact, I cannot think of a single issue I've seen where I can re reproduce it on bare metal, but not on a VM or vice versa. Vice versa. So cross operating system, that does make much more of a timing distance. VM versus bare metal, not really. So if you've got to do some debugging on an operating system you don't normally run, a VM should be absolutely fine. And that brings us to the end of the session. Um, I will quickly head over, to, or I will shortly head over to the chat to answer your questions. Meanwhile, my contact details are on the slide, as are the website for the Tomcat project and the link for the Tomcat source code. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found it both useful and interesting. Thanks very much.